and I'm the co-director of the New York office of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, a foundation affiliated with the German left party and active in international politics around the world. Why do we host today's event? Actually, we do think that the mass appeal of sports creates unique opportunities to discuss some of the most important political issues of our time from gender rights and race equality to capital accumulation and labor exploitation. Well, the alliance of capitalism and sports is something we discussed along these lines in our Urban Convergences conference that we held last September in New York. Here activists, academics and politicians from India, Brazil and South Africa discussed amongst other issues the legacy of World Cup and Commonwealth Games in these countries. It's that combines these and other political issues that we will discuss tonight. In celebration capitalism, the public pays while the private sector profits. In the case of the Sochi Games, we talk about an astonishing $51 billion dollar more than the costs of all other Winter Olympic Games combined. So the Games have always been about class. They've also always been political. Those people who tell you that the Olympics are not political are rehearsing a fairy tale that is meant to dissuade you from thinking hard about what's really going on. The Olympics are positively thrumming with politics. On Friday at the opening ceremonies, we'll see marching, the flag waving. During the medal ceremonies, we'll hear the national anthems. Then there's the selection of corporate sponsors, the production of athletic apparel, often done under dubious working conditions, the decisions about who will host the games, the torch relay, where it goes and where it doesn't. Historical side note in regards to the, the torch relay, it was actually developed for the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, hosted by Hitler. Hitler wasn't actually all that keen on the Olympics, and then his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, convinced him this was a big propaganda boom, and they, boom, and they developed this idea of running the torch around the country to, to get everybody excited about it. Fast forwarding to 1976, which for me is a pivotal year for thinking through the Olympics and also through celebration capitalism. The Olympics in 1976 kind of got hit with a double whammy. First of all, they awarded the 1976 Winter Olympics to Denver. Residents of Colorado, and specifically Denver, rallied against holding the Olympics. They were concerned about ecological devastation. They were also concerned that there was going to be a huge price tag for the games that they were going to have to foot. And ultimately, they passed a referendum that said we weren't going to fund the games, and the IOC had to actually move the games from Denver over to Innsbruck, Austria, the only time that's ever happened. 1976 was also important because of the, the Summer Olympics in Montreal. Famously or infamously, Mo Montreal Mayor Jean Drapeau said the games could be staged for a, a mere $125 million. He assured critics that, quote, the Montreal Olympics can no more have a deficit than a man can have a baby. Yet, by the time the closing ceremonies rolled around, the Montreal Games were the most expensive ever at the time, $1.5 billion, so $125 million to $1.5 billion. They didn't pay off that puppy until 2006, 30 years later. And to top it off, two years after Montreal repaid its debt, a man had a baby. In 2008, <laughs> in my home state of Oregon, Thomas Beatty, transsexual man from Bend gave a birth to a healthy baby girl. So basically, Drapeau was wrong across the board, right? More importantly, perhaps, Montreal paved a path for what I call celebration capitalism, where the public pays the bulk of the game's costs, becoming a fiscal backstop in the pinch. But to understand celebration capitalism, we need to take a moment to talk about Naomi Klein's disaster capitalism. In her book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, Klein explains how neoliberal capitalists capitalize off catastrophe. 
She argues the goal is to exploit social trauma, like natural disasters, an economic sharp downturn, coup d'etat, terrorist violence. These spark collective states of shock that can often soften us up to give up things that we would otherwise ardently defend. In short, she argues that capitalists team up with their collaborators in government to install neoliberal policies rooted in privatization, deregulation, financialization, and so on, where they previously did not exist. The idea is to deliberately dismantle the social welfare state while snuffing out Keynesian principles and programs. Neoliberals' off-cited man mantra is to let the market decide. While Klein argues that privatization can also be paid for with public money, her primary contention is that the ultimate goal of the corporations at the center of disaster capitalism is to normatize privatization of the public sphere, to convert government responsibilities into corporate, corporate functions. But capitalism is a nimble shapeshifter. I'll argue a little bit today that the Olympics themselves are not fundamentally a neoliberal affair. To be sure, the Olympics emanate neoliberalism in many respects. They've become much more commercialized as private capital has taken on a higher profile role in regards to corporate sponsorship. Also, private security firms have assumed a bigger role in policing the games. Yet, the public routinely pays for a large majority of Olympic costs rather than privatizing them and corporate sponsors hold a privileged position for future PACs. The free market does not decide. Rather than deregulation, we see a stringent regime of rules and regulations emanating from the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. In fact, I think the, game, the Olympic Games have become the paradigmatic example of celebration capitalism, though there's other things that happen in our society that also conform to it. I guess one way of thinking about it is celebration capitalism is sort of like disaster capitalism's affable cousin. Both of them occur in states of dis uh, exception. For Klein, this is a tragedy, a perilous moment. For celebration capitalism, this is a moment of exuberance where people are celebrating. Uh, both allow plucky politicos and their economic buddies to get away with things they would never be able to get away with during normal political times. And again, we don't see privatization, but like, like she talks about with disaster capitalism, instead we see these so-called public-private partnerships that are actually quite lopsided. As Stephanie said, the public pays and the, and the private entities tend to profit. Though elite-level competition is a full-time job, the very definition of amateurism states that salaries are prohibited. Most athletes labor for mere subsistence costs, though many of them are not even guaranteed this supposed luxury. This near poverty level economic status stands in stark contrast to the vast sums of money directly generated by athlete labor. So then, where do these profits land? For US team athletes, privatization of the sporting hierarchy gives us a bit of an answer. During my years as a luge athlete, I competed in the name of the United States yet I received no government support. Our athletes and sports institutions operate within the unchallenged economic stranglehold of full corporate subsidization of their activities. In that position, my social identity was that of a worker, one among a pool of just another sector of the exploited US labor force. Living on the bare minimum of basic subsistence costs, if I wanted a new pair of sneakers, I had to go out and get a job. So I was an athlete by day and a waiter by night. Meanwhile, my main corporate sponsor, Verizon, was cashing in. And during the Olympics, it wasn't just Verizon stacking capital, but all Team USA sponsors. Basically, anyone with a financial weight to buy rights to the Olympic brand. Even the rings themselves have been, have been copyrighted by the IOC, reserved exclusively for use by corporate sponsors. We need look no further than this fact to see the structural identity of the IOC, the USOC, and each sport's national governing body. These organizations essentially are forced to mediate between athletes and corporate sponsors, solidifying a relationship of exploitation. As a participant, the illusion, the myth of what the games were supposed to be about was called into question even before my spectacular Olympic crash. Despite the fact that I had failed to connect with the nationalistic glory of my march in the overpriced 
over-the-top opening ceremonies. It took athletic tragedy to open my eyes to my position within the system of exploitation. My own status as a commodity became very apparent in the aftermath of my crash. Due to the sensationally brutal nature of the incident, there was the inevitable but short-lived spike in media interest in my condition as I checked out of the hospital. But as the Olympic newsreel turned on to the next newest thing, all of a sudden I had been wrong of value. Having sustained relatively severe multiple injuries, I was confined to my room in the village, abandoned and discarded, left in isolation by those who had attended to me with the utmost care in the lead-up to the competition. I had become worthless, and this contrast was perhaps the most shocking part of my entire experience. Though I tried to go on the season after the games, I was no longer mentally present in that world. After being brought into awareness of the illusion, the pain of athlete, elite athleticism was no longer something I was willing to subject myself to. At least on a subconscious level, I knew I couldn't continue under the pursuit of a set of goals that now seemed empty. Retrospectively, I see the roots of my own radicalization and the onset of my gradual awareness of myself as a commodity. Later released from the constraints of labor that was exclusively physical, I began the process of coming into an early form of political consciousness. In moving toward a position of intellectual immersion into the systemic realities of the larger socio-political context, I was able to locate and contextualize my form, former position as an athlete, what my actual place and role in that system had been. I gravitated towards socialist thought almost inadvertently, with no concrete political education on the topic, no political community to foster that development. So why did I move toward this kind of consciousness? No doubt a focus on Latin American studies during my undergraduate degree was influential, <clears throat> but it was certainly not a direct line to socialism. I think this trajectory can more realistically be see seen as rooted in a past identity in which I was a commodity of two types. As a worker, I have been labor since childhood, but I was also an actual product, a human being to which a dollar figure was attached in preparation for sale at market value. I, I was recently in Brazil and I was uh, interviewing uh, an old economics professor, a leftist, uh, about s statistics that I saw that said that spending on the World Cup and the Olympics would actually help the Brazilian economy. And he looked at me and he said, uh, he said, do you know what a mankini is? And I said, what, what's a mankini? And he said, it's like, you might call it a speedo. And I was like, ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had seen those in Brazil, yes, yes. And, and he said, well, statistics are like a mankini because they show so much, but they hide the most important parts. <laughs> and, and that's, I would argue, is very true about the Olympics and about all the statistics you're going to hear, and frankly about some of the statistics you guys just heard here about how much money the Super Bowl <laughs> brought into New York. And there's a lot of numbers, few of them are true, but let's talk about some of the numbers we do know about the Sochi Olympics. First one, 51 billion. That's how much money this is going to cost, 51 billion dollars, most expensive Olympics in history, more than every other Winter Olympics combined. Second number, 40 billion. That's how much the Olympics are over budget. Another number, 30 billion. That's what has disappeared from the Olympics. That is unaccounted for. I mean, y'all see that movie with like Michael Caine, Jesse Eisenberg, where they're all the magicians and they make big things disappear. Terrible movie. But this is literally what happened. Like they made 30 billion dollars just disappear. Another number, 8.7 billion. That's how much the railroad is going to cost that goes from the Olympic Village to the top of the mountain where the skiing is going to happen. That is more money than the ticket price, uh, the sticker price, I'm sorry, on the Vancouver Olympic Games. The entire games. This one road, 8.7 billion dollars. Uh, Esquire magazine, Russia's Esquire, figured out that if they had paved that road entirely with beluga caviar, it would have cost less than 8.7 billion dollars. So, <laughs> Why has this cost so much? There, there's an easy answer, and that's just to say, well, the country is in thrall of klepto, mafia, capitalism, and that's why this has taken place. And Vladimir Putin is basically Tony Soprano with better facts. <laughs> that's an easy thing to say, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. I mean, let's, let's start with Sochi itself. I mean, I'm no winter Olympian like Sam over here. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, <laughs> But I do know that a very important prerequisite for Winter Games is snow. And um, <laughs> that's the expertise you guys came for. Um, 
And it's a fact that Sochi is a subtropical climate. It was the former vacation spot of Joseph Stalin, and it's on the outskirts of the heart of the Chechen War, which over 20 years has taken the lives of 160,000 people. So the very fact that the games are in this particular location, I mean, it was a recipe for this kind of overspending, and it's a signal of Putin's own arrogance, because he was going to use the Olympics, as he put it, to the International Olympic Committee. This will remake the region. Instead, what it's done is loot the Russian economy and set up Sochi as a place where terrorism is a distinct possibility over the next couple of weeks. And I, I really want to underline that point because I think people, particularly in New York, are familiar with the terror fear okie doke. You know, it's like, there could be terrorism, quick, give us your rights before it's too late. And in this case, it's actually very real which leads to another number, and that's 60,000. That's how many security forces will be on the ground in Sochi. 60,000. There's going to be missile batteries, underwater sonar, drones, mobile mechanized bomb detectors, comprehensive surveillance of every email or phone call, roadblocks, forbidden zones. It will be a force. Yet, even though the terror fears are real, of course they are using them to go after activists. I mean, they, there's been a lot, even in the sports page, of sports writers who are now scared because they're going over there, saying, having articles where they say, I never thought I'd say this, but I'm longing for Putin's iron fist against the jihadists. That's an exact quote from one sports writer in the Washington Post. And yet, who has been targeted? Well, one group that's been targeted has been environmentalists, because it's been an environmental catastrophe in Sochi, including they took a wetlands and covered it with cement is one thing that they did. And one environmental activist named Yevgeny Vishiko has been held now for, he just was arrested, he's being held for 15 days on charges of public swearing. And 15 <laughs> days will take him out of a lot of the action for the Olympics. Animal rights activists are being targeted as well uh, because people may have read this news today. One of the things that Putin and security forces are doing is the mass extermination of stray dogs uh, throughout the region. And I want to highlight that point, because if there's one thing that gets Americans angry about something, it's when you mess with dogs. So, like, let's, <laughs> please, let's signal that. But there's, but one thing is true, though. It's like, if you have a passion, if you have an issue, if you have something that you care about, these Olympics are such an unreal clusterfuck of injustice that there is probably an issue that you can find that you can be angry about and organize around. So in that regard, Vladimir Putin really has brought us all together. Um, <laughs> But at this point, we need to ask a question, which is, how is it possible that in a scenario as corrupt and evil as this, is this going to be the site of some of the most stirring resistance for LGBT rights? And Kehau being activists, and Brian Boitano coming out um, only after he was named to this delegation. Uh, it's, it's an amazing thing. And um, Obama referenced this strongly in the State of the Union address just recently. People might have heard it. He said, quote, we believe in the inherent dignity and equality of every human being, regardless of race or religion, creed or sexual orientation. And next week, the world will see one expression of that commitment when Team USA marches the red, white, and blue into the Olympic Stadium and brings home the gold. Now, to be clear, I can understand why someone might be hearing that, a uh, LGBT teenager might be hearing that, and that could be feel like very inspiring and very exciting. And I don't want to discredit that at all, the feelings that that could produce in people. But at, at the same time, we also have to say that in that State of the Union address, he did not say a word about ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, he did not announce a long hoped for executive order again, banning discrimination by federal contractors. And this is still a country where in 59 <coughs> states it's legal to fire people on the basis of their sexuality. And keep in mind also, the New York Times just had this article, there are eight states in this country that basically have the equivalent of Russia's anti-gay propaganda laws. Uh, activists call those the no homo promo laws. And they're in eight, this is in eight states in this country. So all this talk of look at Russia, look at how bad they are in gay rights. Eight states in this country, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, and our, our least favorite carnival of reaction state, Arizona, narrowly beating out Florida, I guess, um, is, also has these laws on the books. And it's worth remembering this because, you know, a lot of people have been talking about, you know, John Carlos, you know, 1968 Olympics when he and Tommy Smith raised their fist. Let's remember that John Carlos and Tommy Smith did not go to Mexico City to protest Mexico. They went there to raise their problems with what was the problems back at home. And I think that's something we have to keep in mind going forward. So it's like, why is 
Obama doing this? Why is he raising this issue so loudly and proudly? Well, and especially when India just passed these anti-LGBT laws and he's not saying a word about it. I mean, you also have to look at this in the context of the United States' conflict with Russia on Syria, on the Middle East, on oil. There are a host of issues at play that are playing into this. And the only thing that should matter to us, the only thing that should matter to people who care about LGBT rights on an international level should be after the cameras are turned off, after all the athletes go home, after all the streamers have been cleaned up, is life better or worse for the LGBT community in Russia? That's the only thing that really matters at the end of the day. And I would make a strong case that when President Obama and other European officials use this opportunity to be like, hey, screw you, Putin, what, one of the things that that does is it opens the door for Putin to enact further repression and say, oh, you're just a tool of the United States when that's hardly true at all. And honestly, you saw this today. Like this, I wrote, I wrote about this a couple weeks ago, and you saw today the head of the IOC, Thomas Bach, he made this totally obnoxious statement about polit political leaders, as a reference to Obama, he said political leaders using their athletes to spread their own political messages, which is as if they're just puppets of the Obama administration, and that's totally not true, because the athletes have been acting on this first, long before the administration said a word. So in closing, if we're internationalists against oppression, then we need to speak with one voice, uh, especially on the question of people's basic civil rights and basic human liberties and basic right to exist, whether that's in the United States or whether that's in Russia. And as for the Olympics, as Jules said, you know, it started as an orgy of nationalism, reflecting the, the worst, most backward politics of the ruling class of the late 19th century. Today, the Olympics, I would argue, reflect the worst and most backward politics of the ruling class of the 21st century. And if we want a better expression of global sports, we're going to have to link arms with rebel athletes and do something about the world we live in right now, both on the athletic field and off. So thank you very much.